Uh, my name is Rich Lazardo. I'm the president of the Buckley Program. Uh, before we, before I introduce our guests for tonight, um, let me give a few words about what we do. Uh, we, our mission is to promote intellectual diversity here on campus, uh, and therefore to allow for an outlet that provides um, views that are not regularly represented here on campus or are often marginalized. Uh, to that end, we host a speaker series. We also have, uh, we also sponsor internships over the summer, and we do a number of other things, um, including sending sending students to conservative uh, conservative uh, conferences like CPAC and so on. Um, but our guest for tonight, uh, Senator Evan Bai, he's been in public off in public service for over 25 years. Uh, he's known as a conservative Democrat. I don't know. Um, how, how much he likes that term conservative, but he's certainly to the right of many of his Democrat colleagues. Um, he started back in 1986, running for uh, and being elected to Secretary of State of Indiana. Uh, and there he, uh, after that, two years later, he became the governor of his state. He's been there, he served two, ter two terms, and after that, in 1998, he ran for senator, he won. The interesting thing is that when he ran for re-election in 2004, uh, he won over 60% of the vote in a state that voted 60% for George Bush. So there's a lot of uh, layover there. It's good. Um, and he retired in 2010, and hopefully he can go into uh, why that ha how that came about, and uh, he'll be talking about um, the current state of Washington. One last thing, uh, or a couple of more things, actually. Uh, since leaving, he was involved in No Labels. One of the students just brought that up. Uh, which is a nonpartisan political organization um, that's devoted to problem solving. They, ha they have a lot of Republicans, Democrats, and independents involved. Um, one last thing that I'd like to mention, though, is that Indiana, the Indianans should really love our program because after Mitch Daniels last year and now Mr. By today, uh, we've now had more we've now had more governors come from the state of Indiana than anywhere else. Um, hopefully, over <laughs> um, hopefully we can continue that trend, but. <laughs> Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Senator Bai. Thank you very much. Well, Rich, thank you very much for your very gracious uh, remarks. It's um, not often I'm introduced pretty much the way I wrote it, so I'm grateful to you for <laughs> sticking to the script tonight. And um, I want to thank all of you for coming and just say what a privilege it is here to be at this great university where we had a chance to uh, walk around a little bit. I've taken the college, I have two. Uh, tw I have twin sons who are seniors in high school, so about a year and something ago we took a tour of the university. It was just a phenomenal place. It was winter at the time, so it's a little prettier out today, and I wish they could be with me to just see what a beautiful place it is. And um, I want to thank all of you for having an interest in the topic, uh, because uh, at the end of my remarks I'm going to offer you some thoughts about what we can do to try and repair what's going on in Washington. And my belief is one of the most important things we can do is to get more concerned citizens involved. I think we'd get better outcomes in D.C. Not enough people take part. So I want to thank you for having the intellectual curiosity uh, and the commitment to our country to, uh, to be here to think about all this uh, tonight. So uh, my topic was the state of Washington, which I took to not mean the state on the left coast with Spokane as the capital, but instead uh, where I used to work in the Senate for 12 years. And, uh, Obviously, the state of Washington today is not uh, terribly positive. If you, um, I think it was embodied by someone in our home state who came up to me, oh, it's been six months or nine months ago, and he uh, had a twinkle in his eye, and he said, he said, Evan, he said, uh, I'd like to ask you, do you know the definition of the word politics? Well, I was pretty sure I did, but I, I thought I'd play along. And I said, no, tell me, what is it? And he said, well, it's really very simple. It comes from the Greek word poly, meaning many. And the English word ticks, meaning small blood-sucking insects. <laughs> so uh, I think you know, many Americans sort of have that uh, uh, feeling about politics these days. It's certainly reflected in the polls. Congress's job approval rating now is hovering anywhere between 5% and 12%. Uh, you couldn't make some of this stuff up. They took a poll in the last month or so, and Congress was now, at least at that moment in time, less popular than colonoscopies. Uh, but in a ray of uh, uh, hopefulness, Congress still ranked, was still more popular, more highly thought of than the Kardashian family. So at least there are some standards that uh, uh, they can cling to in Congress and have some reason for optimism. Uh, joking aside, uh, you know, 12%, 5% popularity rating, obviously Congress is not held in high regard. That's not so uncommon. Since the founding of the Republic, 
it's been a national pastime to poke fun at Congress. What is different, and historically, people have disliked the institution but have liked their own representative, that's now changed. And for one of the few times since the advent of modern polling, a clear majority of Americans now, when asked, I think the last poll I saw was 55, 56 percent, said they would vote to replace their own congressman or woman. So dissatisfaction with the institution has now morphed over onto dissatisfaction with their own representative. And when asked the question, if you could vote to replace the entire Congress, all of them, 535, the House and the Senate start over, uh, more than 70 percent of Americans said, yeah, let's just blow the whole place up and start all over again. Uh, the president's uh, job approval rating is higher than Congress by a fair amount, uh, but it's what they call underwater in uh, polling parlance. What does that mean? That means his uh, disapproval rating is higher than his approval rating. Uh, in the last poll that I saw, and this was somewhat before, a few days before the whole shutdown crisis reached its uh, conclusion, he was probably at 43 uh, percent job approval rating uh, and about 47 or 48 percent disapproval rating. Uh, and so anytime an incumbent is under 50 percent, that's not a, you know, an ideal place uh, to be. Uh, so uh, there's this dissatisfaction with Washington, and uh, it's being driven by a, a number of things. And by the way, I was not a big fan of the filibuster when I was in the Senate, so I don't intend to give a, you know, long, long speech tonight. I'd a lot rather have questions and answers and get a dialogue going, but I would like to just kind of frame to you what I think the nature of the problem is. Uh, th this paralysis in Washington, which has led to the, um, you know, in some ways has led to the low job approval ratings, is driven by a number of things. The first thing is the economic anxiety that many Americans are feeling today. Real wages, wages adjusted for uh, inflation, have been stagnant for a decade. So the standard of living for the average middle American family has basically not improved uh, in 10 years. This is an aberration in the American experience. We've had recessions, we've had ups and downs, but really you take out uh, the you know, decade and a half following the Great Depression, uh, these have been fairly temporary recessions. Even the bad ones have been followed by fairly quick recoveries and a beginning of improvement in the standard of living for you know, middle class families. That's just part of the American experience. Not during the last 10 years, stagnant for 10 years at a time when college costs have been rising, health care costs have been rising, uh, you know, uh, uh, retirement security has been uh, jeopardized. So in some real senses, wages are big stagnant, but if things that people really care about have been going up in, uh, in costs, the middle class uh, and their standard of living has in, in fact been shrinking. And so that has created a great deal of anxiety and economic insecurity, particularly on the part of middle and lower class uh, Americans. If you've been in the top, you know, 5%, you've done okay. Uh, return on capital has been pretty good. If you've gotten an, an education at a great institution like Yale, you've done well. The premium placed upon that in the marketplace today is still high. Uh, but for other Americans, uh, you know, their standard of living has been uh, under assault. The unemployment rate uh, peaked out at, you know, more than 9% during the Great Recession. It's now gone down. It's, you know, give or take about 7.5%. But it's been going down in part not because the economy has been churning out a lot of jobs, and in particularly good paying jobs. The unemployment rate has been going down because people have been giving up. We're one of the few countries uh, that measures the unemployment rate uh, by those who are actively looking for work. If you just are so frustrated you give up and stop looking, you're no longer counted in the statistics. And so there have been enough Americans my age or older, and sort of the baby boom have retired and just kind of said, okay, enough, we're retiring. And then enough workers in the current workforce below the retirement age who are just so frustrated they just stopped. And that has meant that the unemployment rate has come down, but it's not a sign that happy days are here again and the great American job creating machine is once again working uh, at a very high level. Unfortunately, it's not. We're, we're generating, you know, normally you've got to generate more than 200,000 jobs every month, month after month after month, to just absorb new entrants into the workforce to keep the unemployment rate static. We haven't really been doing that. We've been close, not quite there for the last you know, uh, year or two, and before that we were actually losing jobs. So again, uh, the statistics belie a great deal of uh, job insecurity uh, on the part of many, uh, many Americans. So uh, the final economic statistic I would give you is that uh, Americans are innately optimistic. It's just a part of our DNA. People came here seeking freedom and opportunity. 
And with fits and starts, if you look back at the trajectory of history, for the most part, our country has been on an inexorably better path for more than two centuries, with some gives and takes. Uh, so, you know, when asked historically, since the time the Gallup poll started asking this question, back, I think, in the 1950s, question, do you expect the future to be better than the past? Always. Uh, the answer was yes. For the first time ever in the last year or two, uh, a, a majority of Americans are now expecting the future to not be as good as what we've experienced in the past. And so that drives their feelings about uh, a whole host of things, their own futures, the children, uh, the, the future that their, their children will inherit from them, and of course they look to their elected representatives. They don't expect government to solve all their problems, uh, but at least to try and do something about the drivers of this anxiety. And they instead see a Washington that's just gridlock and stuck and focused upon the acquisition of political power and ideological differences rather than practical solutions to the challenges that we face. Uh, so let me deal with that a little bit. If you took a, uh, an opinion poll today of the American people, all the states that uh, you come from and, and all the others that aren't represented in the room here today, and ask a basic ideological question, uh, do you think that the government should be more active and involved in addressing society's challenges? Or is the government too intrusive, trying to do too much, uh, and should be less active in trying to deal with society's challenges? The American public today would be split right down the middle 50-50. So there's a basic ideological difference within our country about the role of government. That would normally be reconcilable among Americans. If we sat down like a PTA meeting or a you know, uh, gathering of a non-for-profit organization, we wouldn't agree on everything. We'd have our differences but we'd probably be able to reach a consensus and reconcile our differences on at least a few things. In Washington today, that's just not happening. Even on relatively rudimentary things, it's not happening. Why? Well, there are, are systemic parts of the political process today that are exacerbating these ideological differences that exist in our society and driving them to an extreme so that the chasm that separates the two parties and the two you know, uh, belief systems uh, is greater than it has been in my lifetime. Uh, why is that? Well, let's start with some just basic mechanical things. House of Representatives, 435 seats. No more than, I think Charlie Cook, who's a very astute political observer, he now says that there are probably 20 uh, that could change hands in the upcoming election. Uh, even in a tidal wave election, it's usually no more than 50 or 60. So if you do the math, 370 at most uh, of the seats in the House of Representatives, those races are decided in primaries. They're really not up for grabs in general elections. And in most elections, it's actually, you know, 400 of them are decided in primaries. So if you think the real threat to you politically is in your primary, if you're a Democrat, what do you do? You tend to move to the left because that's where most of the passion and the energy is in the Democratic Party. If you're a Republican, what do you do? You move in the opposite direction. You move to the right because you're afraid of a primary challenge. And that's where most of the passion and energy and, and resources are in the Republican primary today. So in the House of Representatives, you see that the middle falling away as the two sides uh, go to the extremes, driven largely by the gerrymander uh, in the House. And I think uh, another statistic, you can look this up, this is not gonna be precisely accurate, but you'll get the point. Something like no more than a dozen or so, Democrats come from districts that were carried by Mitt Romney. And the, the, the opposite is also true. No more than a dozen or so Republicans in the House of Representatives come from districts that were carried by Barack Obama. So there just aren't a lot of purple House districts out there. And that means that usually if you're going to reach some sort of consensus or compromise, it has to take place in the middle. There's just not a middle in the House of Representatives anymore. It just doesn't exist. You have mostly far left and mostly far right and a handful in the middle, and they don't account for a whole lot in the House of Representatives today. So that's the gerrymander has dramatically affected the House. Well, what about the Senate? The Senate doesn't have uh, district lines being drawn. So why is the Senate so polarized? Well, a couple of other things have happened in the Senate. Low voter turnout in primaries has really changed the Senate. And this started a few years ago when Bob Bennett, he actually didn't have a primary. He lost in Utah. He, his, his father had been governor, senator. Bob had been a three-term senator. Good guy. I served with him. Uh, got to know him fairly well. Nice man. He lost in the party convention in Utah. Lisa Murkowski, 
Her father had been a uh, senator, was uh, the governor. She lost in the Republican primary in Alaska. Uh, a guy named Mike Castle, no one here from Delaware. Mike Castle was the two-term governor from Delaware, was a sitting member of the House of Representatives. In polling against the likely Democratic candidate in the general election, was ahead by 25 percent. He would have been the new Republican senator from the state of Delaware. He lost to Christine O'Donnell overwhelmingly in the Delaware primary. And she went on to lose that race by 25%. So the Republican primary electorate rejected a guy who was going to win by 20% and chose someone who went down in flames by 20, 25%. Uh, in uh, Nevada, Harry Reid was in deep trouble. And uh, the candidate more likely to win was not nominated there. A woman named Sharon Engel was uh, nominated. Colorado, great guy. Michael Bennett, I think he may have gone to Yale. Great guy. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted he's in the Senate. He might very well have lost to the more electable Republican, but a fellow named Ken Buck was chosen in the primary, who then went down to defeat to um, Michael Bennett. The reason I mention all this, well, let me add one other example a little closer to home. In my home state of Indiana, last year, so that's what I was describing was two and a half years ago, just last year in Indiana, Richard Lugar, a six-term incumbent, 36 years in the Senate, so popular in uh, the Hoosier state that six years ago, we didn't even run anybody against him. It was a, f a fool's errand. Why run somebody against Dick Luger? We're wasting our time and our money. Let's focus on something that actually may be doable. Uh, so he did, was un unopposed. Loses the Republican primary by 20%. This is a beatdown. A six-turn incumbent loses his own party's nomination by 20%. Well, what was going on there? Well, a number of things were going on there. And you could, you know, we can talk about what they were. But the key takeaway on that race, if you want to remember one statistic, this was a high-profile election. There were millions of dollars of TV ads run, radio ads, direct mail ads. This was not some secret election taking place that no one knew about. I mean, everybody knew there was a, a primary going on. 18% of eligible Republicans voted, fewer than one in five. And in other primaries, it's actually less than that. So you have a very small sliver of your party's electorate. And the same thing would be true in the Democratic Party. So you have a very small uh, percentage of the primary electorate choosing the nominees. If 40% of Republicans had come out to vote, or 50% for sure, Dick Luger probably would have won. But instead, you've got 18% uh, of the most uh, partisan, the most ideological, uh, participating in primaries. And by the way, Luger did not vote for Obamacare. He did not vote for the stimulus bill. He did not vote for the Dodd-Frank regulatory bill to redo Wall Street. He didn't vote for any of those signature accomplishments of the Obama administration. It was other, you know, smaller stuff, but that was too much. So that was, you know, he was a, a, an outcast, a renegade. That was the end of him. My point is that the Senate is polarized because, believe me, the members sit there and they look at this and they think, oh, my God, look at all these incumbent, uh, incumbents, even incumbents who weren't opposed last time, suddenly being challenged in their own primaries and losing. Boy, I better not let anybody get to the right of me if I'm a Republican or to the left of me if I'm a Democrat. I better move over here to the side. So low voter turnout in primaries has really affected the behavior of many senators and has led them to be reluctant to compromise with members of the other political party on practically anything, not just the big stuff, but even the little stuff for fear of being challenged in a primary. Second thing has polarized the Senate, and that's the role of big money. Uh, again, six years ago, Dick Luger would have won uh, even if he'd been challenged uh, from the right in the primary. Even if there'd only been an 18% turnout, he probably would have won anyway. What changed? Uh, well, there was a case called Citizens United happened. And I don't know whether it's sound jurisprudence or not. I'm not enough a constitutional scholar to comment on that. But I can tell you that it's had a profound impact upon the political system. How so? Well, his challenger, who, you know, six years ago, probably couldn't have raised, you know, more than $100,000, $200,000, and in fact didn't raise a lot of money himself in this uh, contest. But there were in these so-called independent expenditure groups came into the state and spent about $6 million running negative ads against Senator Luger about why he was no good and about why he should be defeated and so forth and so on. And that was a, um, a, another major factor in his defeat. So these senators are sitting there and they're thinking, all right, I see all these primaries going on. I see people being challenged from the extremes. No one's voting in the primary, so I'm, it's only going to be the most ideological and the most partisan people who are showing up to vote that I'm going to have to kind of appeal to. Oh, and by the way, if I stray even one iota 
from the party orthodoxy, from the party line, I'm going to have millions of dollars coming in to beat me up over that. It has made senators in both parties, again, I'm talking about uh, you know, uh, Senator Luger in Indiana, he happens to be a Republican, but I'll give you an example on the other side. Uh, two and a half years ago, a good friend of mine, Blanche Lincoln, uh, we were uh, two members of the Twins Caucus. She also had twin boys, and we came in the same year, uh, from Arkansas. She was challenged by the lieutenant governor in the Democratic primary. Day after, or 24 hours from the left, saying she'd been too moderate, she'd been too conservative to really be a true Democrat. So he was running as just a, you know, an old time, not old time, that sounds pejorative, he was running as a more a progressive, more liberal candidate, saying she'd sold out, compromised too much. Within 24 hours, a group called moveon.org had raised a million dollars for her opponent, and organized labor came in and spent $10 million in negative ads against Blanche Lincoln because she would not support a piece of legislation uh, involving card check, making it easier for unions to organize. Now, I suspect that the labor unions thought that uh, Blanche was going to be a goner anyway. But what was really going on there, I can tell you, was to send a message to the other senators, which was, you don't support you know, our agenda, you know, look what can happen to you. So that's in the Democratic Party. It's hap it happens both ways. So no one votes in primaries except the most ideological and partisan voters. And then big money can come in on either side to punish those who just don't toe the party line and compromise on practically anything. And that's really helped to polarize the Senate. The final thing that I would say, oh, by the way, uh, the presidency. Let's talk about the presidency for a moment. Uh, a little less polarized than the Congress, but if you look at the uh, patterns of uh, the American people uh, and where they move and where they live and so forth, uh, there's been this big disaggregation, uh, mostly within states and districts, but even among states. Uh, and in this last election, out of the 50 states, only four, just four, were decided by 5% or less. So of the other 46 states, Mitt Romney won by more than 5%. My own home state would be one of them. He won Indiana by 10. Uh, or Barack Obama won by more than 5%. Connecticut would be an example of that. The only four states that you could call even remotely close, Florida, North Carolina, who is here from Raleigh? You come from an important state. Uh, Virginia, any Virginians here? You matter. Uh, and Ohio, that's it, those four states. So if you're running for president of the United States and you gotta get to 272 electoral votes to win, you ignore most of the country. And you pour, you spend, you, you camp out in those four states and probably about three or four more, and that's it. The rest of the American people are largely disenfranchised because uh, you go to California to raise money, but you don't really go there in anticipation or for the Republican of carrying the state, and the Democrat doesn't have to worry about uh, carrying California. Texas would be sort of the situation in reverse. So the presidency also is rather polarized. There aren't that many truly swing states out there. and. Um, the final point I'll make about all this, so you've got the gerrymander in the House. You've got uh, the low voter turnout in primaries, the role of big money in primaries affecting the Senate. Uh, even the presidency is somewhat uh, you know, polarized right now in just purely political electoral terms. One of the other things, uh, I'll mention uh, two, and that is our choices of how we get our information in media. I'm gonna sound very old here. My kids, are, when I tell them that there was no such thing as a cell phone, they look at me like, Dad, you're, you know, come on, you know, this is not possible. When I tell them there was no uh, you know, cable television, they go, come on, you're not being honest with us here. So back in the day, when I was um, somewhat younger than you, when I was in high school, there would have been four, I think back then maybe three, major television networks. You had CBS, you had ABC, and you had NBC, and that was kind of it. Uh, now it's a really good thing. We've got many more sources of information now. If you want to do a deep dive on the internet or on cable TV and finding out all sorts of information in much greater detail about candidates and issues, you can find out way more than ever before. And that is a wonderful thing. But a byproduct of part of this is that there has been a self-selection of information sources where uh, you can figure it out. If you happen to be more liberal, you know where to go to kind of hear your own opinions already you know, thrown back at you. And if you're conservative, you know where to go, and you're gonna see an echo chamber of what you already think. Very rarely today, and if you are exposed to ideas from the other side, very often they're caricatured, they're lampooned, as these people are you know, stupid, you know, they're uh, not American, et cetera, et cetera. And so back in the day, there was some obligation to present both sides because there were fewer outlets. Today, many Americans just never hear from the other side. In the United States Senate, 
I was there 12 years. There were only three times in my experience, other than purely ceremonial occasions, when all 100 senators gathered and actually listened to one another on a substantive issue. Only three times in 12 years. Every Tuesday, there's a policy lunch. The Democrats go off and have lunch by themselves and talk about policy. The Republicans go over here and talk about themselves and have about policy. They literally never, never meet together to talk about it. Every Tuesday, uh, there's something called the Democratic uh, Senate Policy Committee. The Republicans have the same thing. There's another lunch. Democrats over here, Republicans over there. Uh, never together. And it's organized that way on purpose for reasons we can get into in the question and answer session if you'd like. But the, the leadership maintains control and power by trying to prevent people from working together. They want to maintain party cohesiveness at all costs and are rather threatened when people try and you know, sort of you know, talk to one another and try and work out compromises. So the whole place is structured to keep that from happening. But the only three times were when there were exogenous events that presented some sort of profound challenge to the welfare of the republic, something outside of the system in the process where the members said, whoa, this is just way too big. We've got to kind of rise above you know, politics as usual and actually deal with this. The first, uh, the impeachment of the president. So I was sworn in as a member of the Senate uh, on one day, and the next day I was sworn in as a juror in the first trial of a president to remove him from office since 1868. The difficulty was, so the Senate is sitting, the, the, the House impeaches, so they're the, the prosecutors, and they actually had prosecutors, 10 of them. Um, and the president has in his attorneys, the Senate is the jury. So there are 100 jurors, the Houses are the prosecutors. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, William Rehnquist at the time, was the presiding judge. The problem was, no one had saved the rules from 1868 when Andrew Johnson was impeached. So we had to have a trial. No one really literally knew what are the rules of evidence going to be? Who's going to speak first? Who speaks second? How do you vote? I mean, literally, no one knew. So there's a constitutional crisis. We're on the cusp of removing the chief executive officer of the country. And there's no one, we're just making it up. So uh, we gathered all 100 of us in the old Senate chamber. And for about five hours, went back and forth. And it got pretty heated because it was pretty, you know, it was a lot of politics. And so finally, we just said, OK, we, we got to figure this out. And it was interesting sitting there. Every so often, a Republican would stand and speak. And I'd say, you know what? I think he made a pretty good point on that. And every so often, a Democrat would stand up. And someone on the other side would acknowledge. They'd say, you know, I think on that, you may have something there. But we were actually listening to one another. It never happens. Never. Uh, any of you watch C-SPAN, the debates in the floor of the United States Senate, some of them may be going like this, I believe in this and I want to tell you this. There's no one there. I mean, literally. I mean, they're just, you know, talking to the camera. And so there are no senators there listening to all that. But in this case, there was. So what did we do? Uh, the Republicans chose Phil Graham. Uh, there was a couple Texans here. Yes. Phil Graham from the state of Texas. And no one's going to uh, question Phil's conservative credentials. And the Democrats chose Ted Kennedy from Massachusetts. No one's going to question his liberal credentials and said, OK, you guys go take 24 hours, sit down, and come back to us with a proposal, and we'll deal with what you come up with. They went, with that as their marching orders, they went out with their staffs, worked on it, brought it back the next day. It was adopted 100 to nothing. I mean, you couldn't get a commendation for Mother Teresa out of the Senate on a 100 to nothing vote. Someone would filibuster for some reason or dissent or do something. So, I mean, we were actually listening to one another. And so we came up with what we thought were fair rules to conduct the trial of the president. And the trial went along, and, you know, you can argue with the result, but not, uh, as far as I know, nobody has argued with the way the proceedings were actually conducted. Second time was the 9-11 uh, attacks. All 100 senators gathered in the Senate dining room three days after the attack, and there was a palpable sense that the country was under assault, because we had been. Uh, 3,000 people had been killed in New York. The Pentagon had been struck. The plane that was brought down by the heroic passengers in a field in Pennsylvania had been, it had been intended for the Capitol, the very building that we were meeting in. And so this focused the mind. And so the, there were really no Republicans or Democrats in the room that day. The only question was, what can we do about this? What's the threat? How do we protect the country? What do we need to do? And that lasted for you know, two or three months and then uh, dissipated uh, in the heat of the upcoming uh, election. The third and final instance was in the immediate aftermath of the, um, uh, the financial crisis. And to show you how hard that was, to show you just how hard it is in Washington today, let me tell you a story. I'm going to digress for 30 seconds. 
So I'm at home. It's about 9 o'clock at night. The phone rings. I answer the phone. Senator, uh, the Secretary of Treasury wants you to come down to the Capitol for a meeting. I say, you're kidding. I said, no. I, how soon can you get there? I said, well, I can probably be there about 9.30. Get on down here. So I came down. I was on the banking committee for all 12 years. And so I walk in. There sits in a little private room uh, Hank Paulson, who was the Secretary of the Treasury, this is while George Bush was still president, uh, Ben Bernanke, Chairman of the Federal Reserve, and 10 members of the Senate Banking Committee, about half Democrats, about half Republicans. Paulson turns to Bernanke and says, Ben, tell the senators what the situation is. Bernanke is an economics professor. He's not given to hyperbole. He's not very verbose. He's just kind of just the facts kind of person. So this is as close as I can recall pretty much a verbatim recitation of what he said. He st he, literally, he said within 48 to 72 hours, we will experience a complete meltdown of the global financial system. It will take thousands of businesses with it, including some major firms that are household names. It will cost our country millions of jobs. And if we are not fortunate, it will rival in magnitude the Great Depression. Period. I mean, it was like 60 seconds. That was it. And then there's silence. And so we're all kind of looking like this. And finally, somebody speaks up and says, well, we can't have that. So what are we going to do? And that's when Paulson started, you know, the first iteration, he got at his blank sheet of paper and started coming up with the TARP program, which then morphed instead of buying toxic assets off the balance sheets of banks, which is going to be way too complicated and take way too long. The country injected capital into the banking system. We've now taken almost all the capital out. And in any event, uh, it kind of had several iterations of, as it was going along. And to end the story, uh, you know, a week or so later, this was all precipitated, by the way, when, the Fed, uh, when uh, Federated, a very large money market uh, company, broke the buck on their money. So when you put money in a money market fund, they're supposed to be riskless. You put a dollar in, you're guaranteed to getting a dollar out. Federated said, uh-uh, can't do that anymore because of what was going on in the short-term credit markets. It was just seized up. You couldn't get short credit, uh, term credit. Uh, for you students here, a, a president of a major university came to me and said, uh, a third of my student body isn't coming back to school next year or next semester. I said, why not? No student loans, gone. Uh, couldn't get a loan to buy a car. Couldn't get a mortgage on a house. I mean, just it was seized up so that even sensible credit was not available. And so that set off a chain of a chain reaction. Federated broke the buck. And uh, a lot of major financial institutions that rely upon overnight lending couldn't get access to any lending. And the whole financial system was just going to collapse. And a whole lot of people, there's a lot of blame to go around. Government deserves some blame. Wall Street deserves some blame. There's a lot of blame to go around. But the point is, millions and millions of people who had nothing to do with any of that, who hadn't taken out low interest loans they couldn't afford and all that, they were going to lose their jobs, their businesses, et cetera. So comes up for a vote in the Senate. And the leader thought it was so important. And the Senate, the Senate's rather Roman. You go in, you can catch the eye of the clerk like this, and then you vote yes or you vote no. Uh, and so uh, it's usually kind of a chaotic thing, people coming and going. The leader thought this was so important, just like the impeachment. He asked us to stand at our desk. We had to vote, rise one at a time. The roll was called alphabetically. And we had to rise and say yes or no. And so we went down the roll. Senate, this was, this was political death. Uh, in my state, uh, our state, it was, I think, my calls and letters, emails, 15,000 to 1 against this. The bankers got us into this mess. Let them go. Let them go bankrupt. Who cares about them? Uh, just, you know, uh, enough, enough already. Nobody, who's bailing me out? Who's coming to rescue me with my problems? Let them go. Uh, so this was politically very, very toxic. But the alternative was letting the entire economy go down. So uh, the Senate, and I think a demonstration of some political courage, passed the bill 75 to 25 with about equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans voting yes and voting no. So it was a bipartisan, it was one of those things people realize this is not a partisan deal. You know, we need to vote our conscience on, on this one. And some people lost their seats. Uh, Bob Bennett in Utah probably lost his seat over that uh, vote. It goes over to the House, and uh, each side has a cloakroom in the Senate. And at least in the Democratic side, there's a big flat screen TV in there, and sometimes they'll have on, well, any number of things. Uh, but in this particular case, they had on one of the cable networks, news networks, and the screen was bifurcated. On the left-hand side, you had the voting in the House, very unlike the Senate. It's electronic in the House. 
So as they vote over a period of 15 or 20 minutes, you can see kind of the tally coming in. Yes, no, hasn't voted yet. On the right side of the screen was the Dow Jones Industrial Average from CNBC, Financial Network. And so we start watching this. They open up the vote in the House. You know, here we all just cast these really awful votes. And we watch it, and the votes start coming in. And after about five minutes, we start looking at each other, and we say, oh, my God, they're voting no. And the House did vote no. It was too politically painful. These, those guys got to run every two years. They don't run every six years. All of them were up for election, not just a third of them. And they voted no. On the right side of the screen, the Dow Jones dropped 730 points in an hour. Boom. The economy was going to collapse. You know, these stocks worthless. You know, who's going to buy, you know, uh, invest in the market in that kind of environment? So gone. Uh, and the House looked at that and figured, okay, we can't have that. We now have had a, a, a visible demonstration of the consequences if we don't try and do something. This thing is imperfect. No one likes it, but we got to try something. And so they came back in the next day, basically passed the same bill with no changes, effectively no changes. But it took looking into the abyss uh, for the House to, to you know, get enough uh, consensus to actually do that. Um, and those are the three times that all 100 senators uh, met together. That was it. And those are the three times when we actually you know, dealt with some very serious problems in a somewhat bipartisan way. So uh, the final thing that I would mention, and then I'll just touch upon a couple possible solutions, and then let's throw it open and have a good dialogue. If you really listen to the, you want to get down to the heart of all of this, uh, let me tell you a little bit about my father. <coughs> Bless you. My father served in the Senate for 18 years from my state. He was elected in 1962 to his first term. Uh, the Republican leader early in his term was a man named Everett Dirksen from uh, Illinois. Uh, in 19, sometime early in 1968, uh, on the floor of the United States Senate, my father, who was a member of the Democratic Party, the Republican leader, Senator Dirksen, came up to him, put his arm around his shoulder, and said, I know you're up for re-election. I'm going to do what I can to help. This would never happen today. We used to have over to our home uh, for dinner Republican senators and their families and vice versa. I mean, it was uh, people knew that it was they were kind of in it together. Uh, why was that? Well, the generation that went through the Great Depression and almost saw the collapse of the capitalist system in this country, the generation that went through the Second World War and the struggle against fascism, the generation that went through the long twilight struggle against global communism and finally prevailed, they knew firsthand that there were greater threats to the well-being and the future of the republic than members of a different political party or people who, had to, who happened to have somewhat different ideological or philosophical beliefs. Okay? We should argue about these things, sometimes heatedly, but at the end of the day, we were all Americans first and in it together first. Um, now, not so much. That generation is fading away, literally dying off. And there's not that same sense of we're all in it together. Sure, it surfaces after 9-11, uh, but uh, that dissipated pretty quickly because that, thank God, was more or less a one-off event. Um, so the final thing uh, about all that, and then a couple of things we might do about it, uh, two sayings I'm very fond of. One of them was from a civil rights leader who once said, we may have arrived on these shores in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. There's a lot of truth in that but not enough Americans, and particularly people involved in politics, look at it that way. And the final saying uh, is from Lyndon Johnson, who grew up poor. Uh, he's from Texas, from the Hill Country, uh, grew up without much. And he had a saying, you know, he was, uh, you read some of those books, he got things done in the Senate. It's a little bit like the, uh, the uh, movie that won some of the Academy Awards about how Lincoln got the um, amendment to the Constitution enacted. Probably go to jail if you tried to do things uh, that way today, but at, at least they got some things done. And Johnson had a saying, he was able to get things through a Senate, which was not always easy, particularly civil rights and some other things, which was you know, pretty tough. And um, you know, particularly for some of his Southern colleagues who had supported him to be leader, and he was now asking them to cast very difficult votes. And he had a saying for, you know, he said, that anybody who's not willing to settle for half a loaf, well, that man never went to bed hungry. You know, if you're hungry, half a loaf is better than none. If you're looking for economic opportunity, some is better than none. If you're looking for a better education system, K through 12, that meets better international standards, some progress is better than none. If we're just stuck all the time, 
arguing over perfection or obsessed with our ideological differences and we don't make any progress, this is probably not in the long-term well uh, interests of the country. Uh, so we need a greater sense of common purpose and we great, need a greater sense of practic practicality and progress over narrow partisanship and rigid ideology. Yes, you've got to have core beliefs, uh, without, core beliefs. without that, you're nothing but a, a soulless mechanic, uh, a legislative mechanic. But you also got to realize, as Ronald Reagan realized, some progress is better than none. On the left, LBJ, some progress is better than none. So what to do about all this? Uh, some of you are from California. California is trying an interesting experiment in what are called unified primaries out there. They don't have a Democratic primary and a Republican primary for the House of Representatives. They got one primary. Everybody runs together. So what does this mean? This means let's take a very liberal district. Right now there might be a very liberal candidate who would get 30 percent of the vote uh, and go on and be the party's nominee and serve in Congress. Uh, but 70 percent of the vote you know, had gone to other people. Now the second place candidate, instead of being a Republican, who will have no support within the Democratic Party, might be a moderate Democrat. So what happens? The more liberal candidate will get a majority of the Democratic vote, but the moderate Democratic candidate will get, you know, a decent chunk of the Democratic vote, not enough to, you know, outweigh the liberal. But then you've got the 40 percent or so of Republicans. They got nowhere to go. They're looking at two, two Democrats. So who do they vote for? They vote for the way left candidate or they vote for the more moderate candidate? They probably pick the more moderate candidate because they say, well, at least he agrees with me on something. So that may, and the same thing would work on the, in the very, very conservative district. So we got to uh, follow this experiment in California and see if it leads to the election of people who are a little more moderate, a little more pragmatic, a little more uh, able to kind of reconcile, you know, differences and work together. It may, it may not. Time will tell. There's not much you can do about the role of big money. That's constitutional. Um, uh, jurisprudence, and there's not going to be a constitutional amendment uh, about that. But the real takeaway on all this is, in a democracy, it's up to all of us. You know, with this political dysfunction, it's up to all of us. If only 18 percent of the people are choosing the nominees, shame on us. You know, if you think that they're too ideological, too partisan, uh, not willing to work together, vote for someone else. Give money vote, encourage your neighbors and family members to vote. If we got that figure from 18 up to 40 or 50, the process would be you know, a lot different. And vote in general elections too. Because uh, the final thing I'd say, well actually the next, I keep promising you that, this is the next to last thing I'm going to say. What needs to happen in Congress is that people need to be as afraid of losing general elections as they are of losing primaries. Because then what they're going to think, right now they're thinking, okay, I don't want to be you know, a complete cynic and a complete sellout. I want to do the right thing. I'll get through the primary and then I'll kind of, you know, you know, I won't have to compromise so much. I can kind of vote my heart, vote my conscience a little bit more. Uh, and uh, so they move to the right or the left. But if they know that that's just ultimately a fool's errand because if they are just too extreme, they're going to lose in the general election, then a little light's going to go off. And they're going to say, you know, I'm running a, a political risk either way. I may lose in the primary. I may lose in the general election. But at least I want to go to sleep at night and put on my head on the pillow and feel good about myself. And so I'm going to do what I think is right and let the political chips fall where they may because I'm running a risk one way or the other no matter what. I think you may see uh, a little more of that going on. And the final thing I'm going to say is sometimes people ask if I'm optimistic or pessimistic about the uh, future of the country. I'm going to leave you on an optimistic note because in spite of all these challenges and we are going through a dysfunctional time in our political process, I've got 17-year-old boys and there is no country on earth. I've been all over. I've been to, you know, 150 countries. There is no place on earth I'd rather have them grow up and, and, and live their future. And as long as we can uh, remember what the core values were that this country was founded on, which if you distill it down to its essence, is freedom in all of its manifestations. The freedom to speak your mind, the freedom to worship God as you see fit, or not at all if you see fit, the, people, the freedom to associate with people of your own choosing, the, people to enjoy, the, the freedom to enjoy the fruits of your labors, the freedom to elect the uh, uh, people to represent you in government that you see fit. As long as we remember that, I think this country is going to be, uh, uh, have a future that's bright indeed. So having said all of that, uh, I always get to ask the first question. Uh, I see a camera back here, but I assume that's for the university. Uh, the first question I always get to ask, I've learned the hard way. Are there any reporters here tonight? <laughs> okay, well, seeing none, you can ask me whatever you want. Who's got the first question? Uh, 
Well, that's okay. What, for the student paper, who do you report for? That's fine. I'd rather just talk to you. I was being somewhat facetious anyway. I learned to deal with members of the fourth estate a long time ago. <laughs> so what do we do? Oh, can I just call? Well, we have to report. <laughs> this is for posterity. You need to speak in the mic. So what do we do whenever partisanship and ideology means that <laughs> members of the House of Representatives or representatives or members of the Senate don't listen to the leadership anymore? such as with Boehner's own inability to deliver his caucus in the House. What do we do then? Well, uh, I feel a little sorry for John Boehner. Um, he's a good person, uh, but, uh, and it, it happens on the other side too, it's just more manifest in the uh, Republican caucus in the House right now. Look, I don't think we're gonna have a government shutdown again, and I don't think we're gonna come up to the edge of default, because at the end of the day, again, in a democracy, uh, it tends to, you've got to win elections, right? And so I think if you've seen the collapse in the poll ratings for the Republican Party, now that may be temporary, it may come back, I think some of the folks who uh, oppose the Speaker's uh, plans to avoid the situation that, you know, that they ended up in, I think they're going to realize that it was somewhat self-defeating. And it's self-defeating because if they end up electing more liberal Democrats, and even if Nancy Pelosi is going to be the next Speaker of the House, uh, boy, they may have stuck to their principles, but will, it will have the ironic consequence of actually empowering people who believe in much different principles than theirs. So you've got to balance belief and conviction uh, and uh, principle with some level of practicality. Uh, now, if you want to just be, you know, 100% um, you know, unbending, you know, uh, teach in a university, write an op-ed, write, write a, be a columnist for a newspaper. I mean, you can just kind of be right down the line. Uh, you know, have a political science class of some kind, right? Uh, but uh, so uh, I think you'll see a little bit different, uh, different behavior on the part of the Republican caucus because of uh, what the outcome of that was. Now that said, uh, you could uh, hear from my, one of my constant frustrations, uh, the introduction was right, I tend to be uh, more of a moderate to conservative on some economic and fiscal issues and somewhat more progressive on social issues. So I'm kind of a, I'm a, a mixture of different beliefs. I've never found one ideological point of view that for me just satisfied all of life's challenges. So I try and, you know, choose those ideas that I think make sense uh, depending on what the issue happens to be. But I was definitely, I think my last year in the Senate, and this tells you about the Senate too, uh, they have one of these, and these tests are all, only as good as the votes that you choose, but I think I was rated as the most conservative member of the Democratic caucus. But I was, I was still rated as being more, uh, more liberal than any Republican. So there's no crossover anymore uh, in the Senate. And um, so, but the point I wanted to make is I actually think it's a good thing, at least from my experience in the Senate, it would be a better thing if the leaders just didn't have total control all the time. It would be better if people talked to one another and tried to work out some compromises because the leaders very often are answering to forces within their parties uh, that, um, uh, I just don't think it's the healthiest uh, form of democracy. So I would actually favor a, a little less strength of leadership in the Senate. But in the House, I don't think they're going to go, having burned their hand on that stove once, I doubt if they're going to go back there again. And if I was advising my Republican friends, it would be to focus on winning the next elections. Because that, if you want to change the Affordable Care Act, there's only one way you're going to do that. And that's by winning elections and actually changing the legislation. That's a good question. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Uh, you spoke extensively on... So, sorry about the Cowboys yesterday. I'm actually a Bears fan. How did that happen? I feel like everyone's a Bears fan in this room. Um, but uh, you spoke a lot about the dysfunction in our government, and you kind of contrasted it with what I think was a very idealistic idea of what things were like in the past. Um, is there merit to that? When Ronald Reagan was president, for example, the government shut down eight times. Uh, as far back as 1800, you had a situation where opposite sides literally believed that the victory of the opposition would lead to the ruin of the country. So is the polarization, the dysfunction we see today historically unprecedented? Is it really something unique? Or is it just kind of a continuation of what we've been as a country forever? Uh, and we've rallied in the moments you talked about, like on the verge of an economic meltdown after September 11th. Is this really historically unprecedented? No, we've gone through other periods which were very polarized. I mean, the run-up to the Civil War was an incredibly polarized period and was only uh, 
The role of slavery in our country was only resolved after uh, 700,000 Americans lost their lives, and many more uh, were severely wounded. So that was a very polarized period, and there, there have been others. So uh, it's not that it's um, historically just without any precedent. It's that it's damaging to us, particularly in a – what's different now uh, from other periods in our nation's history are, number one, it is a globalized world, and the pace of change is much more rapid. So back when large oceans separated us from our competitors, you know, both militarily and economically, and the global economy wasn't so integrated, if we got things wrong here, well, you know, it was bad, but it wasn't quite as calamitous because we didn't have real you know, competitors out there, well, you know, ready to take our share of the global markets or uh, otherwise. Today, you know, if we allow uh, the debt to continue to grow, and um, you know, eventually uh, we're going to suffer the same fate as Western Europe, possibly. So we've got to come to grips with some of these, not in the near term, but in the long term. So the globalization has changed things, and just the pace of change has changed things meaning that a dysfunction, the consequences of dysfunction are uh, more profound than perhaps in the past. But it's not without precedent. I think under Reagan, I don't think the government shut down. I think what you're referring to is the debt ceiling had to be raised eight times. The government shut down under Clinton twice. I don't think it shut down under Reagan. But, uh, so, but to your point, it doesn't matter whether it's Reagan or Clinton, it did shut down you know, within, our, within living memory under Clinton. Uh, but uh, my impression is that he and uh, Speaker Gingrich actually uh, managed to work through that a little bit better than what we're seeing uh, today. Is that right? You, you're getting some uh, off uh, mic. Yeah, no, it, it's, it, it's not important, but I just, I think most of them were one day shutdowns, but I'm pretty, uh, so they were, have to double check it, but no, thank you, Senator. Symbolic. It's not like the two weeks or so that we've had now, but in any event, um, I do think uh, the, um, well, there's a whole book out now, uh, Chris Matthews' book about uh, Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan and their working relationship. So I, I think your point is actually well taken, which, which it, is, it is good to not uh, mythologize and look for uh, you know, periods in the past where you know, the, the land was just filled with milk and honey and people just sat down and you know, just you know, worked together without, you know, in harmony without any acrimony. That you know, never existed. Uh, but uh, I do think that uh, this situation rivals some in the past, and the consequences of it perhaps are more profound, given the fact that we have global competitors that weren't as, at least over the last, since the Second World War, not nearly as significant as they are today. Yes. Hey, but, uh, you know, as far as I know, there haven't been any recent canings on the floor of the Senate, uh, <laughs> which, used to, which used to take place. And by the way, if you want to go on... Uh, you know, TiVo gets some uh, footage of the uh, Taiwanese parliament and them, you know, beating on each other. It's, uh, it's out there. So, you know, there are other systems that uh, have their own uh, political divisions, too. Yes. Yeah, you've talked a lot about the polarization of, you know, the Democratic and Republican parties and how there's not too many purple states or districts left anymore. Do you think um, the solution to that involves working, I guess, around the two-party system? and you know, strengthening it more or sort of breaking it down? Well, that's a great question. If you look at the polling today, um, the American public says, and I think it's important to emphasize says, uh, that they would be open to supporting a third party more than at any time in, in the recent past. Uh, you know, you go back, uh, you, some of you are probably too young to remember Ross Perot's two uh, candidacies, so it would have been in what, uh, 92 and 96, I think? and. Uh, you know, he got, when he, he got into the race and he got up to, you know, around 30 percent of the vote, he then dropped out, just dropped out after the Democratic convention. He thought Clinton was making sense, so he dropped out. Then not so much, he got back in. So still after, you know, getting in, getting out, getting in, he still got 20-some percent of the vote. And then he ran four years later, and I think it was down to like 10 or 12 percent. So that's a pretty good chunk of the vote. But historically, the procedural barriers to getting on the ballot and to actually establishing a long-running third-party movement, you look back across history, it hadn't been done since the rise of the Republican Party in the 1850s. You had uh, third-party candidates uh, run in the 30s and the 40s for a variety of reasons, but it was you know, kind of a one-off movement, just like Perot uh, proved to be a one-off movement. So what normally happens is that, like Perot's big issue was the deficit. And Clinton, uh, with the advice of Bob Rubin and some others, decided he'd run, on, he'd run on a platform. He wanted stimulus. He wanted to come up with a spending bill. And he got in there, and they said to him, you know, Mr. President, you really can't do that under these circumstances. We'll probably didn't go past Congress anyway. So uh, they began to take a first credit for getting the 
the deficit debt. First President Bush deserves a lot of credit. He took the first bite at it, bipartisan bill. Clinton deserves credit. A woman named Marjorie Margolis Ms. Vinsky cast a deciding vote. She lost her next election. That was a Democrat's only approach. And then under Gingrich and Clinton, and a, once again, a bipartisan approach, they worked together to kind of continue to get it down. I remember sitting in the banking committee, the testimony, Alan Greenspan, you're going to think I'm making this up. You can look it up in the congressional record. It would have been 2001 before the attacks. So the question was whether we should have the Bush tax cuts. And Greenspan was there to testify that he was in favor of the Bush tax cuts. And so he's testifying, and uh, just think about this. This was, uh, what, 12 years ago? The testimony of the chief monetary official of the United States was that the projected surpluses were so large that we would completely pay off the national debt, and the government would have so much money left over that they would be tempted to, they had to put it someplace, and they're going to be tempted to start buying equity stakes in private enterprise. And this was going to be bad for the, you couldn't have the government owning big chunks of the private economy, because uh, that's just not our system. And so, in a responsible way, one of the things we needed to do was to dissipate the surplus, including tax cuts. Boy, did we solve that problem. <laughs> so, I mean, if you think Washington can't do anything, at least we solved that problem. Um, so, uh, in any event, uh, what happened was the Democrats absorbed the deficit reduction message, Clinton did, and began then, the deficit began going down and the Democrats' poll numbers on how to deal with the deficit began improving. So what happens is one of the two existing parties, if there's a real popular issue out there, tends to glom onto it and kind of make it its own. And that's one of the reasons that these um, uh, third party candidacies tend to be uh, transitory. Uh, but, you know, if this keeps going, if you had someone like a Michael Bloomberg or someone with real resources uh, who was willing to stick at it for, you know, 8, 12 years, you might actually see more traction today because people are just really, they're more fed up than I've ever seen them. Last point, uh, there was a group called Americans Elect. Mm -hmm. And what they did, there was a fellow who put $25, $35 million into this. They got their group qualified on 25 of the state ballots before they stopped last time. And their pitch was, look, we're going to get qualified in the state ballots, and we're going to hold an internet nominating convention. We don't care. It can be a Democrat. It can be a Republican. Whoever it is, the vice presidential candidate's got to be of the other political party. And we'll take care of all the work of getting the petitions. We'll get you on the ballot. Just run. And then we'll, through the internet, raise you a bunch of money. Just run. And uh, they couldn't convince anybody to run. So they ended up folding their tent and going home. But there was that movement, and I think... Uh, yeah, if things keep going like this, you might see something two years from now. I guess it would be three years from now. But it's still more likely to be transitory than permanent. Yes? Thank you, Senator, for, Where are you from? for being here. Uh, myself, I teach here. Oh, good for I'm you. What do you teach? Professor Danilo Petronovic, scholar of American political thought. Oh, fantastic. But I also teach in our uh, great books program here, Directed Studies and I have a few, few of my former students are here. So. Wonderful. Um, delighted to have you here. Actually, one of the things we learned in that course, one of the lessons, is that if a people loses its economic freedom, their political liberties uh, follow soon thereafter. I'm curious what you think about that. And sometimes it seems to me that a lot of the leaders of the Democratic Party seem to be unaware of this uh, history. Um, why is that? Why, uh, can you tell us a little bit more, why, why is it that the Democratic Party is not as attuned to this problem as um, some of our more conservative members are? Thank you very much. So the, the theory is that uh, politics follows economics and you lose your economic freedom, you lose uh, your political freedom, is that the? O oversimplification, but there's, uh, yeah, something along those lines. If people lose their, uh, independence uh, to produce and to have their economic freedom, then sooner or later they will become uh, wards of the state. Well, it is, uh, it is true that on balance, uh, most members of the Democratic Party favor a more robust role for government, including rates of taxation and regulation, uh, than most members of the Republican Party. I think that's just probably a true statement. The question is, why do they you know, believe that? And uh, many of them would believe that, um, and particularly uh, in the current economy, where, look, I'm, I'm not a big regulator and I'm not a big taxer. I was happy in all eight my years as governor. We never raised taxes. I always thought that was a good thing, letting people keep more of their money. I thought it was a good thing. That is economic freedom. 
I don't think we need any more regulations than absolutely necessary. I think it's good we have regulations against, you know, child labor and things like that, but, you know, within reason you ought to have let the free economy work. You tend to produce, you know, greater you know, wealth for the society as a whole. The disparities are so great today, I think the counterargument might be that if you have a, an economic system that is producing huge disparities of wealth and you've got a, a political system that is majoritarian, eventually those two things will have trouble uh, coexisting. And if a majority of the people just believe that there is no opportunity for them, eventually they're going to start voting in ways that would be really counterproductive. So maybe to reconcile uh, the, the market system, which is very efficient allocating scarce you know, resources and so forth, with a majoritarian political system, you take some of the, a, little, a few of the rough edges off of the political, uh, of the capitalist system to make sure that it's politically sustainable. Now, if you go too far, as you suggest, you start killing the goose that lays the golden egg. Uh, you don't go far enough, you run the risk of having social and political turmoil that could end up with even more uh, adverse political outcomes. So that what they would say is that, uh, that uh, some role for uh, ensuring some minimum level of opportunity in society is probably necessary for the capitalist system to continue to function uh, in, a, in a democracy is probably what they would say. So, please, no, go ahead. I'd be interested in hearing no, from you. That's why I can follow. I don't want to take up. Uh, but I also think that it's, as you say, it's easy to kind of take things to their extreme. I mean, some people would uh, uh, say today that, uh, well, I mean, t what would be the most uh, uh, heavily regulated and taxed economy in Western Europe? It used to be Sweden. What would it be today? What would you say? I don't well, let's take Sweden. Let's take Sweden. You know, Sweden's got a pretty big, you know, the, the Scandinavian countries have a pretty large governmental role, rates of taxation, regulation, and so forth. They probably haven't lost their, they still vote for their elect, they haven't lost their democracy yet. So, I mean, people would probably point to that and say, you know, what about them? Apples and oranges, homogenous state in Northern Europe versus uh, the greatest uh, diverse democracy in the world. Yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, look, my instincts are toward, uh, you know, my experience has been sometimes the truth lies over here and sometimes the truth lies over there in a political system of checks and balances with the diffuse power among different branches of government and different levels of government that if you're going to actually get things done very often, the truth that is doable is not perfect, but it's probably in here somewhere. And so, um, uh, and to avoid, uh, you know, wild swings from one side to the other, which is hard in our system given the uh, uh, diffusion of power, uh, they'd probably say maximize economic freedom, but then harvest some of the fruits of that efficiency to try and guarantee poli some political cohesiveness and opportunity for those who just feel shut out of the system. Otherwise, you're running uh, the risk, as you do in some countries where, you know, everything is just concentrated in the hands of a very few, of the political system actually collapsing on itself. So, but it, I think your observation uh, in you know, general is the Democrats would favor more of that. And I think, look, I will say this too. You can tell even within my party, there's a difference between people who've been governors, mayors, or who've had experience in the business sector and those who haven't. Uh, and part of that is, uh, you know, it's not that they're not intelligent, they are. Uh, it's not that they're not well intended, they are, but if that's just not of your, part of your skill set, if you haven't actually had to you know, be accountable for a bottom line, which governors are, it, it, or to, to attract, to be economically competitive, if people thought we were regulating and taxing too much in Indiana, they'd locate their facilities in Ohio or Kentucky or move them to you know, Southeast Asia or someplace. So you had to have an appreciation of how markets worked and how things were going to actually function. You had to be you know, a little more practical than if you'd just been a legislative body your whole life. So. Uh, not all Democrats go quite to the extreme. And on the Republican side, you know, there are, we're starting to come full, uh, full circle, and uh, there are actually a few voices out there that want more regulations of Wall Street and that kind of thing. They're coming at it from a populist sort of Tea Party uh, perspective. So I'd leave it up to someone uh, brighter than myself, probably you, to tell me, is, is ideology a, a linear or circular? Uh, in this case, it may be circular. And I, I love the NAFTA debate. You had. Gore representing the left, and you had uh, Pat Buchanan uh, in this debate representing the right, then you had uh, Ross Perot or Ralph Nader, and nobody knew where they were coming from. So that's, but thank you for your question. Thank you for teaching here, too. Yes, yes. 
So on a, uh, a wildly different note, um, I read that in 2008 you were on the short list for President Obama's pick as Vice President. Um, the candidates were all very tall. <laughs> <laughs> all right, the tallest then. But uh, five years I, I, down... I was, I was comparatively short. So I was... Are you shorter than Joe Biden? Uh, I got Joe beat by a, a couple inches and a few hair follicles. <laughs> <laughs> edit, that out of the, uh, edit that out of the film there. Well, five years down the line, looking at both the logjam that President Obama has faced and the like, just shocking amount of fun that Biden seems to have like, on a day-to-day -day basis, are you upset that you weren't tapped for the job? Would you, would you like to have had the job at this point? Uh, I'm not upset. Uh, that's someone else's decision than mine. Uh, but uh, would I have loved to have been chosen? Sure, because I think you have an opportunity. The Senate is a tremendous honor. But you're one of 100, and the place is fairly polarized right now. So your ability to actually get things done is probably more limited than if you are the, uh, sitting at the right hand of the president. Now, it depends on your relationship. If you have a close working relationship, and I think that would be the only basis on which to accept an offer like that, to say, you know, look, Mr. President, I, you know, I expect us to work closely together. You know, have regular meetings to be included in deliberations and so forth. So at least if, you're, if your opinion and your thoughts are constantly there for that person to consider, and you can always pick up the phone and say, hey, have you thought about this? I think you have a, a, a bigger chance to uh, make a difference there. So sure, it would have been great, but uh, you know, going into something like that, that it's, um, I think in the book it said it came down to a coin flip, and I don't uh, know exactly the, the reasons for the decision, but I suspect one of them might have been that uh, Joe's, you know, obviously a well-qualified, uh, you know, good person, excellent choice. Uh, but he came from a state that had a Democratic governor. So if he resigned from the Senate, he was, he was in fact replaced by a Democrat. I came from a state with a Republican governor and would have been replaced by a Republican at a time when the Senate was going to be fairly closely divided. If you're a president coming in or you're running for president and you hope to be in and you know that every vote may be important and it's a really close decision, that's the kind of thing that might make a difference. But uh, thank you for your question. I'll tell you, a, um, uh, it is an interesting uh, process. So I was, uh, they have entire teams of people assigned to you to do the vetting, you know, your, your health records, your tax returns, I mean, everything about you. They talk to your wife, they talk to your parents, I mean, your friends, I mean, everything. It's just the, nothing is unscrutinized. Uh, so uh, I was asked to go meet with him uh, and uh, so I went by myself to Union Station, got in a car with tinted windows at the train station in Washington. They took me out to Dulles Airport, got in a private plane, flew out to St. Louis, went up to the freight elevator so no one could see me, and I'm waiting in his hotel room for him to arrive. And so he comes in, we have hamburgers together. He had ESPN on, so we start talking. And there's this huge, huge stack of all the background materials, I mean, all this stuff that they looked into. And so he says to me at one point, he says, um, you know, I, I've kind of looked through all that, and he said, there's nothing in there that bothers me. But uh, now's the time you got to tell me if there's something about you I should know that, that we didn't discover, because it's going to come out. He said, they're talking to people I went to first grade with. So, you know, you owe it to yourself, and you owe it to me. Just tell me, is there anything I need to know? And I'd gone into the idea. I said, look, I'm just going to tell them exactly what I think. Matter of fact, some of you will enjoy this. Literally, the first question he asked me, literally the first question was, and this is a direct quote, okay, I pick you, who do I piss off? And I decided I was just going to tell him the truth. I said, well, okay. I said, uh, you know, Brock, back in those days, he wasn't Mr. President. I said, I think you pick me, you're probably going to offend the far left and some of the internet crowd because they think I'm really, a, you know, just a Republican in sheep's clothing. And his reaction, well, he goes, he said, those folks, they get on me all the time too. So um, in any event, uh, I thought that was it. So we get to the point he's asking me about, he says, you got anything I need to know. And I'd gone into, I was just going to tell him exactly what I thought. And so I said, um, uh, no, you guys found out almost everything, but there are, I think, three things I should tell you. And I told him what they were. And he looked at me and he said, uh, that's it? And I said, yeah, that's it. And he said, uh, well, you haven't led much of a life, have you? <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny. But when you grow up and you're, you're, one of your parents is in the public eye, you, the last thing you want to do is embarrass them by ending up on the front page of the Washington Post. So uh, in any event, that whole process was, uh, was, was, was interesting. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for uh, your comments this evening. Um, I was very much intrigued and, and pleased to hear your, your thoughts about the systemic 
features that are in place that cause the, uh, the tension between the two parties. Uh, and a follow-up idea to the professor's thoughts about uh, freedoms and um, opportunity. Uh, as you reference, your, your optimism is based in the fact that our country values those conditions or those facets of being a citizen. Uh, can you share your thoughts, if any, on whether or not the Congress or even a state government like here in Connecticut uh, can take any action further in today's society without to, to grant freedoms and opportunities to a segment of population without taking it away from others? You mean economic freedom? E or? Economic or, or I, I, I tend to believe in the philosophy espoused earlier that the political freedom will follow the economic freedom. So I, I sense that we've gotten to the point in our society where uh, we can o the, the legislatures can only help smaller segments by taking freedoms away from a larger segment. Any feelings or reaction to that comment? Re re repeat that last statement. You said you got the feeling that... that... That legislatures, whether it's federal or state, can only grant freedoms and opportunity to a smaller segment of society without, by, only by taking it from a larger segment of society. Kind of a zero-sum game? Yeah. Well, for starters, and I'm glad you asked that question, to get back to the, 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 the professor's question and his comment, I can guarantee you that uh, you know, almost no member of Congress is going to be analyzing these decisions in the terms that you uh, frame them, the broad philosophical deterrent. Maybe, maybe they should, but that just doesn't, that just doesn't, that just doesn't happen. So I think, uh, well, look, your point is well taken. And as my comments, uh, I hope, conveyed, I, I I think that people should be able to keep as much of their, you know, hard-earned money as they can. I think we ought to, you know, maximize freedom. Uh, it's ebbed and flowed throughout the course of our, um, uh, throughout the course of our society. I mean, there was a time in our country when we didn't have an individual income tax. The, uh, the Constitution had to be amended because the Supreme Court had ruled that it was uh, unconstitutional. So, uh, the the point I want to make is that there is a, uh, a to be sure, there's a relationship between freedom and economics. But it's not, I think, a one-to-one -one relation, uh, you know, ratio. You go too far, it can become that way. I mean, if you know, tax rates go up from. Uh, I mean, I had a I had a friend in Indiana once tell me he didn't mind being an equal partner with the government, but he objected when they took more than half. So I mean, if you go up to you know, with confiscatory tax rates, back in the day, I think when John Kennedy, one of the historians here, correct me, he had a tax cut. The, the top marginal bracket was what 70 percent, 80 percent, something like that. Now that would be you know way too much at that point. And then you engage in all sorts of um, convoluted accounting and other behavior to try and you know, get around it, which is not socially very useful. So uh, look, to directly answer your question, I think the way most of them would look at it would be, the, would be something along the following. And even coming from a conservative state like my own, most people would say we'd be willing to pay some money, uh, give up some of what we earn to have a really good public education system, K through 12. Maybe even if our own kids went to private school, okay? If you want to go to a religious school or something like that, uh, now it ought to be for a really good public education system, which you know, doesn't exist in many places right now. And why would we be for that? Why would we, why would we be willing to give up part of our freedom for some, the education of somebody else's children? Well, because if you live in a society that's filled with ignorant people, things probably aren't going to go too well. I mean, even for those who have gotten a good education and have done well, eventually, it's going to come back to affect us all, like the statement I made, we're all in the same boat now. So within reason, uh, it can actually be, and ultimately the voters have the say in most of this, and markets tend to correct if the government goes way overboard. And, or let's say if, if this state were to adopt policies, some of you may feel that they have, that just make it really uh, not economic to locate a business here or to hire people here, they'll move someplace else, right? Maybe retirees move to, if you've got a state uh, inheritance tax, well, a lot of your senior citizens who would be affected by that may move to Florida, so you end up getting zero. So it may make sense to actually have a more moderate, modest tax than one that's viewed as confiscatory. So the point I want to make is that uh, sacrificing some of our freedom may actually be in our own best interest if it actually achieves the, role, the, the goal that we seek. I think most people's objection is that they view that government is just inept, inefficient, and we're, what we're sacrificing for isn't getting the results that we want. And too much of it, I'd say to the professor, is we measure inputs rather than outcomes. We need to be focusing on results. 
And I used to face this when I was governor. In the and this was coming a lot from my party. Uh, they'd say, if inflation was running at 3% and we increased the, 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 the education budget by 5%, they'd go, great, we did a great job for public education because we just gave them more money. And I'd always say to them, well, uh, no. That may be a necessary prerequisite to accomplishing some of the things we want, but just putting more money into a system it doesn't mean anything. It's what the system produces that matters. So we need accountability for results, actually delivering the public goods that the society has a right to expect. And that's a lesson I think my own party needs to learn. I, I saw a poll on this, it's been a few years ago, when asked the question, out of every tax dollar you send the government, how many cents do you believe are wasted? It was a big sample, like 3,000 Americans. Well, some people said 100, and some people said the average? The average Amer American believed 44 cents out of every dollar was going down the drain. Now, why would you give your money to a charity, to a business, to something, if you, if you believe that they were squandering 44% of it. You wouldn't do it. So my point to those who advocate for a you know, robust role for government in addressing some of our challenges is you need to hold the government accountable for results. You need to cut. The people who ought to be most offended by waste should be people who are progressive because it tends to undercut the, the credibility of the entire argument. So uh, to, to get back to your point, uh, if you look at it individually, sacrificing, some, having some of our freedom taken from us. Yeah, does that cost us? Yes, it costs us. But it's possible that if the sacrifice is used productively, in the aggregate it may actually expand our freedom if we're getting the public goods that we want, you know, a quality highway system, uh, you know, drinking water we can rely on. Again, a public school system that we don't have a third of our kids that just they actually get high school diplomas and they, they can't do any sort of meaningful employment because it, it, they got just social promoted all the way through. Uh, if we were giving up a little bit of our freedom to correct those kind of things, then it'd be worth it. So um, I'm afraid I give you a very rambling answer. Yes. I should give shorter answers, we get more questions, but I am a senator after all. So. <laughs> yes. You mentioned earlier that those who have experience uh, either in state Actually, government... Actually, somebody asked me what I like to be, forgive me for what I like to be called, and a, a governor, given Congress is a current, I'm a governor first, uh, Senate, uh, that was a temporary distraction. Yes. Well, I think governor. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, those who have experience leading a state or a city uh, bring different perspectives uh, to Washington as senators. While this is unlikely to happen anytime soon, what are your thoughts about perhaps returning the selection of senators to an appointment by state governments to represent their interests as opposed to popular election? Well, you're right. I don't think that's going to happen uh, anytime soon. And it's one of the, the people who, uh, by the way, in California, they, they also had, were, had adopted a system there where they have a non-elected, you know, more objective group of people drawing the maps to try and prevent the gerrymander. Now, how did they do that? Well, in California, you got the initiative and the referendum. The public just, you know, went directly to the people. In many states, mine included, you don't have that. So you'd actually have the people who have flourished in the system being asked to change the system. That's pretty unlikely. So just having, I think back to the Indiana State Legislature I used to work with, if they were choosing our United States senators, that would not lead inexorably to, I mean, these are legislators choosing other legislators. It's not completely clear to me why they would be choosing people with executive experience or business experience. More likely, you'd see a lot of you know wheeling and dealing and political you know uh, coalition building among the legislators to pick one of their own. It would probably be what you would have going on. But I, it is it is palpable uh, when uh, in the Senate, governors, mayors, people who've had business uh, experience, just look at things a lot differently because you've been responsible for a balance, uh, a bottom line. You've been subjected to the market forces, and you have to t take some of that into uh, account. And um, I found it to be, of course, you know, again, it, I was, having been governor, I probably have that point of view, but I found it to be uh, uh, the people who had that kind of experience were just easier to work with, tended to, you know, compromise more readily. Bob Corker from Tennessee, great guy, been mayor. Uh, you can kind of go down the list. Uh, Chris Coons from Delaware had been a county executive. Michael Bennett from uh, um, uh, Colorado had been the head of the local school district. He'd been private equity before that. So, um, any kind of, there are broad examples of the kind of experience people can have, but some executive experience, some experience in the marketplace where you're subjected uh, uh, 
the, the wishful thinking that, that growth just happens, you know, magically, and there aren't consequences to the decisions you make, whether they're tax decisions or regulatory decisions, which leads to your point. If you're going to take someone's hard-earned money, if you're going to put in place a regulation that limits the, the freedom of movement or you know, how you operate, it better be for a pretty good reason, and it better be because you have a strong conviction backed up by hard data that it's actually going to lead to a better outcome. To just do it on the basis of unproven theory, uh, that's just not sufficient. And so many members of Congress, again, they're good people, they're even intelligent people, but they just don't, that's just not a part of their toolkit that they've had that kind of experience. And it's more in my party, there are a few more Republicans who've been in business just by given their background, but I think it's healthy for both sides to have that kind of uh, experience. If there's one more, I'll take it quickly before we got to go. If not, uh, anybody? You said earlier, yes. You I'm sorry, I didn't get to say hello before. My, uh, the introduction said that. Um, well, your, your introduction said why I retired or what? Uh, okay. Uh, well, so your question is? Where are you going? What are you doing? Well, uh, I'm doing a number of things, the most important of which is uh, I do have two high school seniors, and uh, one's already uh, been admitted to college, and the other one's going to be applying here in the next couple weeks. So we're kind of, my, my wife is focused on Matter of fact, on the drive up here, she was reading me the, his final draft of his, you know, common application essay. So I thought that was a, a kind of, uh, she's a nervous, a little nervous about it. But in any event, so, uh, but I'm um, partner in law, I do no lobbying. I can tell all of you, honestly, I've never called a single government official to ask for anything. I just won't do that. Don't feel good about that. But I have a law degree, so I'm a partner in a law firm. I'm a, a senior advisor to a company called uh, Apollo Global Management. We have a majority uh, ownership in 48 different businesses. If you aggregated all of our employees, we'd be the 10th or 11th largest employer in America. I find that to be fascinating. And we have businesses overseas. And so learning the dynamics of, uh, I'm on the board of directors of McGraw Hills Educational Unit. We just had an eight hour board meeting in Chicago this week uh, about the whole move toward uh, mass online courses, some of which are offered by Yale and Spocks, more specific online courses. And what's the future? They're anticipating that, uh, I'm sure, by the way, all of you are, any faculty in the room here today, you're safe. The conclusion was that the institutions with a real pedigree and brand are going to be fine. But as many as half of the institutions of higher learning in America may go away over the next 10 to 15 years, and as many as half of the professorships may disappear over the next 15 years because of the economics of higher education and what technology can now make available. So your, this man's course could be made available at relatively modest expense to you know hundreds of thousands of people who could never afford to come to a, a place like Yale, even with the very generous tuition assistance that exists here. So, uh, and then our, on, our, our international educational component, you know, how do we do more in Asia and Latin America and what's going on there and there. This is fascinating stuff. And so this business had had some issues. It was not being well run. And so they had to try and, uh, you know, get into a more competitive situation. And I observed to them, you might appreciate this, I said, you know, I used to sit in meetings like this in Congress where we'd talk about all these problems. The only difference here is we're actually going to try and do something about it. Yeah, there they just kind of, kind of, well, okay, this has been an interesting discussion. Now let's, you know, go on to whatever happens to be on the, the agenda next. So I'm doing that. I serve on a, a couple boards of directors, and I enjoy that because it reminds me of being governor. You uh, oversee management. You set broad strategy and then hold them accountable for actually uh, implementing the strategy. And I do some public speaking and some television commentary. And, uh, but in here, I still miss the uh, notion of getting up in the morning and trying to do something, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, noble and that kind of thing. I'm, a, I'm an idealist at heart, in spite of all the uh, uh, evidence to the contrary. It's just the way I'm wired. Maybe a genetic defect, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Thank you all very, very much. By the way, my, 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 my only disappointment is I've never had a chance to go to Louis' lunch. Is, it, is that really where the hamburger was invented? Is that right? Well, I'll have to save that for next time. Either that or one of your iconic pizza places, right? Isn't New Haven known for its uh, really good pizza? Oh, wonderful. Well, next time. <laughs>